Hey, Walter Sorrells back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today, viewer mail. Today, I'll be answering some viewer questions that I think will be of general interest to you guys. But first, a couple of announcements. I'll be putting together my uh, viewer knife video for this year pretty soon. For those of you who haven't seen them in the past, they're just a chance for you know folks who watch this channel to kind of show off knives that they've made this year. It's really one of my favorite things every year. So, you know, whether it's your first knife or whether you're a pro, if you picked up something helpful from this channel over the years, just shoot us a photo of a knife that kind of represents where you're at as a knife maker. I'll release the video in uh, January, so that's giving you about a month to get some photos to me. Just email them to uh, the address down below. So one important thing about whatever photos you send to me, just make sure they're as high quality as possible, high uh, resolution, you know, the better lit they are, the cooler looking your knife is gonna be, and the more likely I am to put it on the video. So hope to see plenty of pictures of you guys' knives. Really looking forward to that. Uh, another quick announcement. I've gotten some requests over the years to release some merch for guys who dig this channel. Finally got around to doing that, so check out the merch down there. You know, it's fun to wear. It helps me help you by making more videos. Um, I've got a few Walter Sorrells Blades items and a few Tactics Armory items for uh, those of you who don't know. Um, that's my line of semi-production, mid-tech, whatever you want to call it, uh, knives. So, turning to viewer questions. And that's a nice little segue to my first question because mid-tech, production knives, whatever you want to call them, uh, that's all about CNC. So, here's uh, a viewer named Will Adams. I was hoping, by the way, I'm reading this off a teleprompter, so that's why I'm not looking down at my notes. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, Will says, I was hoping you could point me in the right direction. I want to learn to use a CNC mill. My local community college offers several courses, but I'm not sure which ones would be most helpful. Should I learn CAD, or is there a more specific 3D uh, design software that would be better? So, a uh, couple, couple quick notes on that. The first is, there are two chunks to CNC programming. One is the design side, and that's covered by what's known as CAD, or computer-aided design programs. And then there's a second piece of it, which is the manufacturing side, covered by CAM, or computer-aided manufacturing programs. Sometimes those are separate uh, and sometimes they're uh, glommed together into one program. So personally I would recommend if you're just getting started with this and you want to learn it um, to try Fusion 360. Um, that's a program that uh, I believe at least when I first got started with it uh, it was available for free to students and people who are you know have very small enterprises and are just kind of getting started. The design side is a prerequisite for the manufacturing side if you're going to be doing this yourself uh, as opposed to being kind of a production type person. And so you definitely want to take a class in CAD first and then CAM. Um, just clarification, there's a program called AutoCAD. Sometimes people call that CAD, but you know there are a whole bunch of different programs like Fusion 360. Um, and I wouldn't really you know, worry too much about specifically which program you have because, um, you know, if you take a class at the local community college, they may teach you AutoCAD, AutoCAD or they might uh, teach you some other program. It doesn't really matter because once you learn that program, you know, you can kind of transfer that to some other program. I'm not going to say that learning how to do the design side is easy, but Personally, I didn't find it that hard. If you screwed around with draw programs and stuff like that, it's not that it's super intuitive, but it's not super crazy hard either. To me, the hardest part is the manufacturing side. Now, if you have some kind of really deep background in machining, then obviously that gives you a, a big head start. And I had done some uh, milling and some you know manual milling and manual lathe work before I ever got started on doing CNC work myself. But, you know, honestly, it, 
it doesn't translate exactly. So there's a pretty big learning curve to this stuff. Key point with the CAD, I mean, with the CAM side, the manufacturing side, which again, I recommend you learn that second, uh, is that you have to do it on the machine. It's not good enough to just, you know, read a book or whatever, you know, take a class and do it all in the classroom. You really have to have hands-on experience with the machine. There's a really recursive sort of process where you learn how to do something, you go put it on the machine, you screw things up royally, and then you learn how to fix your problems and make everything faster and kind of optimize your tool paths and, you know, figure out different types of materials that you're working with. Uh, it's just not a notion. It's a long-term process. If you want to get into CNC, it's a big deal. It takes a long time. You're going to have to spend some money on the machinery. That's just the way it is. But <clears throat> if you do go down that route, it's very satisfying. And, you know, from a production standpoint, lots and lots of cool things you can do with it. So I'd encourage you to give it a whirl and, uh, you know, take a couple classes, see where you go with it. Okay, so next question is from John Craig, a Patreon subscriber. Now, quick note about Patreon, if you aren't familiar with that, that's a way for you to support this channel or other channels that you find uh, to be cool. Uh, link in the cards in the descriptions uh, so you can help out there. I also, by the way, give you access to all the plans for all these different uh, videos that I do. So there's some benefits to you besides just the good feeling you get of supporting this channel. Okay, anyway, so a question from uh, John Craig here, Patreon subscriber. My son came to visit yesterday and he said, Dad, I found something that you'll love. So he uh, came over and he gives me a one inch round steel bar, six inches long, I mean six feet long. So the question John's asking is, is there anything, is there any way that, you know, I can figure out what this is or do I need to just cut a piece off of it, heat treat it and see what happens? So the question is, uh, or the answer is, that's exactly what you have to do. Uh, unfortunately, without a lab, uh, you know, you really can't determine exactly what it is. There is something that you can do, which is using, you know, a, a belt grinder to grind it and analyze the sparks that come off of it. But honestly, if you don't have a lot of experience doing that, that's kind of, you know, that's not going to take you too far. And even if you do have experience, it is not an exact science. So if you got a piece of mystery steel, you know, what you're going to have to do is chop off a little piece of it, flatten it out, heat treat it in some way and see what happens. You know, the normal thing would be heated up to about 1500 degrees, hold it a little while at that temperature and quench it in oil. See if it hardens. If it doesn't harden, do the same thing, uh, you know, into a, a water quench it. Um, but beyond that, you know, you really are not gonna know what you're dealing with and it's gonna be pretty hard to optimize for that particular steel. Not a reason not to do it, but you know, uh, mystery steals, always an inexact thing. All right, next question from a viewer named Devin. Uh, now, Devin had asked me a series of questions uh, about an ax that he was working on. Um, and so these two questions are kind of the most recent ones. They both seem to be things that would be kind of more generally applicable to uh, you guys out there. So basically, he shaped his blade. Uh, and so now his question is this. Now I've got it sharpened. Uh, very sharply. Is it too late? Is it too late to heat treat? And he's got another question, uh, which is, you know, he, he's trying to figure out how he's going to uh, make the handle. This is an axe so, or, you know, hatchet kind of thing. So it's got a long handle. He says, um, does anybody sell knife scales 11 inches or longer? Okay. So um, as to the first question, uh, there's no, no amount of sharpening that makes it impossible for you to heat treat anything, whether it's a knife or an axe or whatever. There's some people who like to heat treat things after a knife is completely shaped. Uh, and there's some people who want to shape it after it's totally heat treated. The disadvantage of heat treating, uh, after it's been heat treated is that uh, the steel's much harder, it's harder to grind, and also, especially when you're sneaking up on that edge, 
it's uh, pretty easy to overheat it and screw up the temper of the knife. The advantage is that it's never going to warp. Um, my feeling is that you know now most guys who do uh, air quenchable um, steel plate quench, which is <clears throat> smashing the um, knife or whatever it is between uh, a couple of plates, <clears throat> which keeps it from warping. So you know I would say most people now not not everybody but most most guys probably tend to heat treat after they've got the knife pretty well shaped. Uh, beyond that, I will say most people don't take it to a complete sharp edge before they heat treat it. The reason for that is that you tend to get a little bit of decarburization on the edge and that's going to compromise the strength of that edge. That said, um, you know, if you, most normal heat treating regimens, uh, the decarburization is not going to be super deep and so if you did sharpen it you know you can just grind off that last teeny weeny little edge resharpen it and all should be well turning to the second question um, there you know micarta is made in huge huge sheets four by eight sheets typically um, that's four by eight feet so um, you know there's no reason that that you have to buy micarta in scale sizes um, you can find it usually from knife making supply houses in one foot by one foot pieces. Um, also, you can go to some of the higher on the food chain suppliers, um, plastic suppliers and folks like that, uh, sometimes even the manufacturers themselves, and you can buy much bigger sheets, three by four feet or, you know, even four by eight feet if you really want something that big. So, uh, no, there's no problem getting big pieces of micarta. All right, guys, that about wraps it up. Uh, oh, one last thing. As many of you know, uh, I've made a series of videos about making Japanese swords that are available only on my website. Now, they're uh, in DVD form, and a lot of you guys, you know, don't have DVD players anymore. I've been getting people complaining about that. So I've been meaning to make them downloadable. Finally got that in the works. So if you're waiting on downloadable versions of my Japanese sword making videos, uh, those will be available pretty soon. Check waltersorrelsblades.com in the future, and they should be there soon. All right, thanks for watching, and keep making those knives. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe, and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years. So I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. Walter Sorrels Blades dot com.